Um, it's on the screen. Is from Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 22, and it's page 1113 in the Pew Bibles. Chair Bibles. So Acts 17, starting at verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him, and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. for reading that, Anna. Uh, Right, now, every day we are struck by images that make us question, where is God, or doesn't he care? From the war-torn pictures of Aleppo, Mosul, uh, to those affected by the Zika virus, uh, those sleeping rough, even here in Westbourne, harrowing images can make us ask, where is God? I wonder if you've ever thought about this. Now, it, it just might be that uh, you haven't thought this way. Um, it might just be that when you're presented with horrors, you find yourself asking instead, is there any hope? After all, asking where, where is God presupposes that you believe in God, and you may not be at that place yet. Uh, no, you might be here tonight just to please a friend. But I want you to know that uh, whoever we are, the Bible has much to say to us, to say to us all, whoever we are, wherever we stand. Because it would be fair to say uh, that even if we don't consider ourselves believers in God, we all as human beings are worshippers. We all inherently choose to worship something as our God. And what I mean by this is that we all choose to invest our time, uh, our energy, our resources in something we consider the source of ultimate benefit to us. Whether this is something invisible, whether it's another deity or a technique that appears to bring success, or we invest in something physical, something that can be seen, uh, like money or health or drugs, beauty, success, our job, our family, our education, our status, our self. 
And we trust in these things, don't we, for our ultimate security. You see, we're all worshippers in some way of things. For we're all built that way. And it's always been so. All through history, human beings have been worshippers. That's why many ask, where is God? Where is God? Especially when things go wrong from our perception. And tonight's passage is great because it answers that question. Because we, we read it was the question that was being answered by the people in Athens. And it was answered by Paul, a spokesperson for God, when he visited them. And so firstly, I want us to see tonight that God is not where you think. God is not where you think. We're going to be looking at verses 22 to 25 and verse 29. Now, I like to think God is dot, 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 dot. You know, that's a common um, thought of people if you get talking to them. Out in Westbourne, uh, they might say, I like to think God is. And um, I help lead a, uh, an addictions course, and in some addictions uh, self-help groups, they like to think that God is a chair, or they like to think God is whatever they can believe in that will help them in that situation. Uh, Wikipedia says there are 4,200 religions in the world, all attempting to know God, or claiming to know God. In Acts 17, to 34, we read the account of when Paul visited Athens, and he was struck by people expressing their thoughts on where God was, who God was. For they had repeatedly made God in their own thinking. They thought he could be found in idols and temples that they had built. And though we might not believe in an idol, oh no, we wouldn't do that, would we? We wouldn't have an idol on our mantelpiece. We still form God or gods in our own image. And we think we know where he resides and how he behaves. Let, let's recap on the account. Now, just have a look at verse 16. We didn't read that, but it, it sets the context. While Paul was waiting for the other disciples in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Okay, now go down to verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and observed your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. The people of Athens had got God tragically very wrong. They had thought that God was someone they could imagine. They had tried to carve God in their own images, imagining him and where he would reside. And so they'd made idols. So that's some pictures of some of those idols that they made. And they made temples. Uh, and they would bow down and worship these idols. And even, we might say today, might we, edging their own bets, you know, what did they do? They made a temple to the unknown God. They were covering all the bases, weren't they? And Paul, he wants to correct their thinking. And we might laugh at them, mightn't we? We might say, we don't, you know. Those people back then, they believed in all that mumbo-jumbo sort of stuff. But sadly, we do a similar thing, just the same. We look at the world with all its horror, and we say, uh, where is God in this? We make the decision, don't we? We say, oh, um, God's not interested. God's not there. He, he's not interested. He's not going to pass judgment on this all the horrors that happen, it's as though we decide that God is living in a box, like a jack-in-the-box, maybe. Or we make other images of God for ourselves. Now, you'll be shocked that I was watching a program 
that was called Botched Celebrity Plastic Surgery. Yes, that's a tragic title, it was a tragic program, but even more so was the tragedy of the truth of this, that there were celebrities like Nikki Minja. Now, I don't expect many of you to know her. Maybe we show, we'll have a show of hands of those who know her, but no, don't worry. If you've not heard of her, all I need to say is she is a pop star, and she claims she hasn't had plastic surgery. But the critics say she has because of the drastic changes in her anatomy over recent years. But tragically, because Nikki Minja has changed her figure, countless others have copied her, thinking she demonstrates ultimate beauty. Now, I don't see any Nikki Minja lookalikes here tonight. Maybe you'll speak to... Am I saying her name wrong as well? Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, the, the, the real tragedy, though, folks, is that the host of that TV show was saying, effectively, celebrity self creates an image that fans adore to worship. And who do we worship? We worship God. Sadly, many people worship celebrities who aspire to godlike status. The time of worshipping wooden, uh, stone, or metal idols may well be long gone in our circles. But we've only swapped these for die-cast gods. Gods of our own choosing. Gods of our own making. For many of us worship gods of our own imagination. The god of family, or work, or stuff. A few pictures there. I walked through the car park the other day, and there was this, I don't know, it was a Lamborghini there, you know, for one man to drive in. And, tragedy, but there's, there's all sorts of things. Folk living for drugs, living for money, living for alcohol. And we think that they will provide ultimate security. But time and pressure reveal that what, uh, what they give is only temporary, shallow, empty, like a bottle of Coke that's agitated. It just becomes froth. So many of these things we choose to trust in and invest in are really just froth. They're unable to deliver long term. They promise us so much. And when we don't get those things, what happens? We can feel that life just isn't worth living until we move on to the next thing. And the truth is, even though these so-called gods promise life, none of them can deliver us from death. What we need to know, of course, is the real God. The real God. The God revealed in Scripture. And so we need to know the second point. God has come closer than you think. God has come closer than you think. And looking at verses 24 to 28 and the second part of verse 31. What Paul is teaching is that God is not where, not where we think. He is much closer than that and more accessible than we think. And in fact, he's come much closer to us. Have a look at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth. Then have a look at verse 26. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Where is God? Look at in our passage. We learn from verse 24. He made the earth. He made the heavens. And that means he made everything in between. And so we see God is close. He's, he is our creator and rule maker. God has made seen things like the earth. Unseen things like the air we breathe. But spiritual things as well. 
And God, as the maker, owns it all. He is the rightful decider on how we should live and, and what we should do. And we get that, don't we, folks? I mean, we all have that inbuilt sense that what happens in our house is down to us, don't we? We'd hate it if someone came in. Say I came round your house tonight, okay, and I said, okay, you're going to paint your living room purple and you're going to paint the window frames fluorescent yellow. Oh, what a horrible thought, eh? But it's a silly illustration. But you see, we live in God's world and God as the maker gets to decide how we should live. That's who he is. He is the maker and rule maker. He is, as Paul says, Lord of heaven and earth. But he's also the maker of men and women. Verse 26. From one man, he made every nation of men. Now what this teaches us is that all men and women and boys and girls are made by him. He hasn't just made those who know him. He hasn't just made us because we've come to church tonight. He's made everyone over the whole world. And in case we bought into the idea that God, you know, made it all and then wound it up like a clockwork toy and left it alone. No, we need to think again. At verse 26, God determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Now, I find that verse staggering. I find it staggering in a world that seems in many senses so random. This verse teaches us that life is not random at all. God is much closer than we think. He's involved in daily life. Do you see that, that that verse says that? He's involved in daily life. He's determined for where you should live. He's determined that you should be here tonight. He's much closer than you think. Now, like a microscope that uh, lets us see tiny details that are there, but they're too small for us to see, the verse says, this verse says, that... Uh, all that happens to us has purpose and the purpose is not random it's so that all men and women and boys and girls as individuals verse 27 might seek the one true God and reach out for him and find him though he's not far from each one of us do you see what this means God is very very close he's much bigger than we can ever imagine he made the universe, all that's seen and unseen. And we wrongly think, oh, if he's that big, he's not bothered with me. He's not concerned with me. He's not concerned with the injustice. He's not concerned with the people that we see hurting on, on the TV screens. He can't possibly be in my situation. He's got other things to worry about. Have you ever thought like this? Do you see how you're pushing God into that box? You're making an idol of God. You're making God out to be that clay image. I used to watch uh, Take Heart. Did you watch Take Heart? And, that, and, you know, whoever made it, but they made those little clay models of Morph and Chaz, didn't they? And we do that with God. We say, oh, he's not like... No, we need to look at Scripture. Instead, we need to heed these words. God is much, much bigger than all of us thinks. But he's much, much nearer than you think. I think we need to think along the lines that God, being much bigger, is much more powerful in every way. Much more concerned with you and I. Much more able to be concerned with us than we could ever imagine. Now, I heard recently of a man who um, made a car out of electrons. He made a car out of electrons. He had an electron microscope, and he made a car out of electrons, and he won a prize for it. Now, it sounds a bit nuts. Why would you bother making a car out of electrons? You know, unless, I suppose, there was little electron people, I don't know, to drive the car. But who knows? But there we go. But power, do you see? Power means you can be bothered with things on a minute scale. 
and God in all his power is able to be bothered with us in fact he is and he's close enough to us to determine where we live where we work where we breathe and the reason is that he wants you and I to reach out to him to turn to him and find him do you see that in verse 27 He's not as elusive as you think. He's not who and where you think. For he wants a relationship with you and me. And if we cast our eyes down to verse 31, we some, see something hinted at that shows God has done something which means he has become even closer. In verse 31, by saying he has risen, the man he has appointed from the dead it reminds us that not only is God very close to us as the maker of the world not only is he close to us because he made us for a purpose not only is he close to us because he determines where and when we live and so he's involved in our daily life but he became close to us in sending God the son as a man Jesus and rising him from the dead. Do you see how these verses bring us, uh, they start off with that grand view and they come down closer and closer to the narrow view, the close view. God isn't distant, turning, turning a blind eye to the world and how mankind treats each other. God cares and he did what was necessary for each of us to turn to him. And so, friends, I have to ask, I have to ask this, don't I? Friends, have you turned to God? Have you turned to God? Are you in that relationship? Or have you been seeking God in the wrong places? If we don't know him personally yet, we need to know this third thing. God commands us to turn to him before it's too late. God commands us to turn to him before it's too late. We see this verse 27 and then 30 to 34. Let's go over verse 27 again. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. Now, this verse shatters the myth that God is hidden and cannot be found. As though he's playing hide and seek. You know, it's like, ooh, ooh, I'm here. You know, some people think that he's doing that. He's playing hide and seek with us. Instead, it tells us that God wants us to not only find him, but turn to him. And if we read on, we see this isn't a passive thing. Because God doesn't, you know, just want us to turn to him if we feel like it. You know, to roll up on once a year at Christmas and say hello to him. There's a reason for all of this. We started by asking the question, where is God when there is so much war in the world? Where is God when there is sickness, injustice, hunger? We've seen he is in fact not far from each of us. And he wants, to, he wants us to turn to him. And in a moment or two, uh, I will say how each of us can do this. But what I want to focus on is related to this big question. Where is God when there is so much injustice? Look down to verse 29. Therefore we are God's offspring. We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design or skill. In the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this by raising him from the dead. Now where is God? 
He's close enough to see what we do. And why God wants us to turn to him is because a day is coming, a day in the future, when he will hold everyone to account, a day of judgment. When we see pictures of war, our hearts cry out. Sadly, I think we become so numb to it sometimes, but sometimes we see a picture and our hearts cry out for justice, don't they? And rightly so. When we see injustice in the world, the reason is we are, as verse 29 says, we are his offspring. And so we display um, aspects of his likeness. He is just, and so as his offspring, we cry for justice. And God has said that one day he will judge everyone that lives or has ever lived. Now, that's good news for us, isn't it? For those of us who want justice. Justice for all those Savile victims. Justice for immigrants. Justice for those who are bombed in Aleppo. But, and there is a but, we are told the world will be judged. The world, and that includes us. We too will be judged, verse 31. And we have to ask, are we ready to be judged? Friends, are you ready? You're not going to be judged by me. You're not going to be judged by the church. You're not going to be judged by those high court judges who made, made the ruling on Brexit the other week. No, the Bible says we're going to be judged, verse 31, by the man God has appointed, the man who was raised from the dead. Now, reading the Bible, anyone will know that this is talking about Jesus. He was observed by eyewitnesses. They observed all that he said and did. They observed him saying that he was going to be killed. And they saw him killed. And they saw him buried. And they saw him raised from death to life. And God says, we will all be judged by Jesus and his standards. Now, in a way, um, we can say lots of things about Jesus, but I want to just focus on this. Jesus, in some way, is like a tape measure. Each and every person will be judged by and up against Jesus. Jesus, the God-man, who never did, never said, never thought anything wrong, Jesus, the God-man who did, said and did everything right, and in a way that was pleasing to God. It's by him and to his template that we will be judged. And sadly, folks, on that basis, we're all going to fall short. None of us will fit his perfect mold. And God who made us has every right to punish us, he has every right to punish those who fall short. And the justice that we demand for the horrors in this world will be dealt. We want the perpetrators of evil and cruelty punished, don't we? But this sadly is where I'm a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. Because we so readily want others punished for evil but fail to see the evil in our hearts. And that evil is as offensive to God, the one who made us. And he's every right to punish us. And so we want to avoid this justice that will fall on ourselves. But you see, the truth is, the God who made us, he knows us. He knows what we are. And there's no escaping him. But, of course, for one rescue plan. The rescue plan is to turn to God and cast ourselves on his mercy. You see, the man appointed to judge, Jesus, also said of himself that he came as a ransom for many. Let's see if I... There we are. 
Mark 10:45. Have a look at it at home. He said he came as a ransom for many. He said that if anyone cries out to him, saying, sorry, sorry for not living how we should, sorry I live in God's world and I ignore God, Jesus says we could be forgiven. If we can see this, that we live lives that are so different from what God wants, we're not, what do we do? So often when someone does something wrong, they, they try to excuse it. Oh, I was tired. Or we try to blame someone else. We're not to do that. God says, Paul says, verse 30, God calls people to repent. Which is another way of saying turn. To stop living life for your own way and instead turn to God. Saying sorry and start living his way with his help. Now remember what I touched on earlier. The many so-called gods that people trust in and worship promise the world, but they don't deliver. They promise life, but none can help us in death and the judgment to come. Only the one true God delivers life and helps us in death and the judgment to come. And just as Jesus demonstrated, didn't he? He demonstrated that he can deliver us from death by proving it from rising from death himself. So how much more we can trust him with the judgment to come. He can assure us forgiveness if we put our trust in him. And so friends, as a close, can I ask you, have you turned to God for mercy? Back in our passage, we read there are only three outcomes from hearing this news. Here we are tonight. We're all here, and we're like those people in the Areopagus. I can't even say the thing, but the council. We're like those people in the council who listen to Paul. Which are you? Only you will know which one you're more like. Are we like those in verse 32? When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Are you so unconvinced by any of this, refusing to believe that there is a God and that he can judge you? And he will raise you, if you've died before this happens, he'll raise you to life and he'll judge you. If you are like that, you're sneering at this. Can't you see how you're putting God in a box? You limit him to your own thinking. Friends, you're in a dangerous place. You're trusting in something that's temporary. You're trusting in a temporary idol. Friend, can I urge you to think on this and come at least come back to me. For eternity is an awfully long time. But maybe you're like the others who said, as verse 32, they said, we want to hear you again on the subject. Maybe that's like you. You're not, you're not so arrogant to say there's no God. There's no God and he won't hold us to account. If that's you, come back again. Or why not come on Thursday to Christianity Explored? And we can talk more on this. Or are you tonight more able to identify with those in verse 34? A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Men and women became believers because they trusted in this message. If you're like them, like so many others here, who come every week and have understood what God has said to you in his word. Can I urge you tonight to turn to him? Can I urge you to choose life, real, eternal life that starts now 
and lasts for eternity. We can do this and we can start this off by repenting and believing. God, remember, created the universe and he created it so that he is listening all the time. And he says to us tonight, if we can hear him speak to us and we want to respond, we can do so by prayer. We can talk to him and he will hear us and he listens to our hearts and he knows if you really mean it. If that's you tonight, can I urge you to do that? I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray with all those. If that's you, God's spoken to you tonight, I want you to pray with me. I'm going to pray some, something like this, admitting you don't live like his appointed man, Jesus. Admitting we don't, we don't live like him all the time. We don't acknowledge God all of the time. We don't do what we should all of the time. And instead of trying to excuse it, instead of trying to blame it on something else, we, we're going to ask for God's forgiveness. Ask for him to show mercy to us. Asking him to forgive your mistakes. And then believe. Jesus said, repent and believe. Turn and trust. It's as simple as that, folks. Believe he's able to forgive you. And so we will thank God for Jesus, thanking that he died for our sin. And then we'll ask his help to live for him forevermore. Is that you? Well, pray with me now. And those of us who already enjoy this wonderful relationship, we'll pray with you so let's bow our heads and if it's you just repeat what I say in your head and God will hear and then please come and speak to me afterwards almighty God our heavenly father I'm so sorry I don't do the good that I should all of the time. I am sorry that I do think and say things that are displeasing to you. Please forgive me for Jesus' sake. Thank you that Jesus died as a ransom for me. Thank you that he paid for my forgiveness. Help me to live for you from now on. Amen. And you know, we say amen because we say true. This is true. Amen. Amen.